um, communion is one of the ways we can come face to face with God. And that's the series we're in at the moment. We're looking at being intimate with God, about being face to face with God, to come before him. Um, we've pictured it like a, a Maori hongi. Hongi? Hong, uh, we, like, you know, when nose meet each other and you're breathing the same breath. And we want to breathe the same breath as God breathes. So we want to come face to face with God. And as we come face to face with God, um, in order to come face to face with God, we need to seek his face. And there's many scriptures in the Bible about seeking God's face. And we started with one this morning in Psalms chapter 24. Um, and most of them are in Psalms. But there's, there's one scripture about seeking God's face, which is a key scripture in my life. So much so that this particular scripture was a password that I used for many years. So if I'd wanted... <laughs> Yeah, so if I wanted to go into my internet banking, um, I would type in my customer number, and then I would put two, the number two, then a capital C for cron, two cron 714, short for two chronicles 714. Now, um, now the bank told... Okay, yeah, well, the bank told me I need to change my password, so I did, and then other people said, well, it's not good to have the same password for everything, so, uh, yeah, so no longer can you get into my banking with 2 cron 714 but at, at one point you could, so that, that's how key a scripture it is for me, probably one of my top three scriptures of, you know, top three verses. Um, um, the other's been actually uh, Matthew 6, 33, this is one that when I was first a Christian, I read this scripture. It says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all other things will belong, um, he will give to you. And I remember reading that and I was a new Christian back in 1997. Um, so I got out my dot matrix printer. If you're under 30, you probably don't know one of those. And I printed it out and I stuck it on my wall. You know, seek God first, seek his face first. And the, uh, the other one of my top three scriptures is Jeremiah 29, 11. And I wrote in the devotion, I don't know if anyone's read the devotion this week, but I wrote in that devotion about that scripture. But today we're looking at my third number three scripture, or not in any order, which is 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins, and I will heal their land. Who here knows that New Zealand needs healing from God? Does anyone know that God um, needs to come and heal New Zealand? Yeah, you all agree that we need God's healing. Well, well, there's a scripture here all about it. So don't we want to be part of it? Don't we want to be part of what God is wanting to do in our land? He's wanting to bring healing to our land. So let's look at the scripture. Let's look at 2 Chronicles 7, 14. And whenever you're looking at a scripture, it's always good to look at the context. Who said it? To whom? Why it was said, etc. And in this case, um, it's just after Solomon had built the temple of God. He'd completed his temple and his palace, and God was appearing to him. So that answers who said it. This is a, a scripture said by God, and he's saying, it to Solomon. And if you look at the verse before verse 13, it says, there'll be times when I withhold the rain from the land, you know, and there might be famines or plagues. But if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, I'll bring healing to the land. Um, so that's the context of it. So let's dive a little bit into it. So we're going to uh, look at the scripture in depth. And it starts with an if. Starts with an if. What does an if mean with a promise of God? Uh, yeah, it means there's something we have to do. But I was thinking about it, and um, actually I was driving, driving my ute. And most of, the, most of the times I was practicing the sermon, I was driving my ute, actually. So ended up, you can't look at notes when you're driving your ute. So I was like, yeah. So anyway, I was, I was thinking, actually, if is an invitation. 
Okay, so when God says if, he's inviting us to partner with him in order to bring his promises and his purposes to the land. You see, if is an invitation, and in the Bible there's many promises, and some of them have this word if in it, and don't go, oh no, there's an if there. No, think, oh, there's an if. What do I have to do about it? You know, what can I do? What's the invitation in the if? Yeah, because, I mean, the Bible's full of promises. Some of them are unconditional. We don't have to do anything about it. Genesis chapter 7, God says, I will never flood the earth again. So what do we have to do about it? Nothing. Not build a boat, unless we like boats. But, um, yeah, um, but we don't have to do anything about it. It's a promise to God that we can rest easy in. But there's other, there's other unconditional promises that we do have to do something about. For example, Joel chapter 2 Afterwards, I will pour out my spirit among all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. You see, that's an unconditional promise. God is going to pour out his spirit on all people. But we have to position ourselves to be among the people he pours out his spirit on. Because when he says all people, he doesn't mean everyone. He means, you know, he means all people groups. Yeah, so we, it is an unconditional scripture, um, but that we still have to do something about it ourselves. But this one, it's got an if. And what that means is that God wants to bring healing to New Zealand. He wants to bring healing to the land, but he's not going to do it unless we partner with him. And unless we join in with him and do our part, um, he's not going to do his part. So we need to partner with God in order to bring his promise into being. But the, the, the great thing about God's ifs, all of God's ifs, they're not hard. They're not difficult. Deuteronomy chapter 30, and Marge, you've already spoken this chapter, but I'm going to look at verse um, 11. It says, the commands I'm giving you today, they are not difficult. They are not beyond you. You know what? Every one of you here can humble yourselves. Every one of you here can pray, every one of you here can seek God's face, and every one of you here can come to repentance, which is turning from our wicked ways. So what God's asking us to do, they're not difficult things, they're not too hard, they're not if, um, who wants to be a millionaire ifs? If you can answer these 10 questions, you can have a million dollars. And nobody or hardly anyone ever takes a million dollars because it's just too hard. Well, it's not like that with God's if. There are things that we can do. Uh, Jesus puts it another way. He says, my burden is light and my yoke is easy. So that's if. If my people. Well, who are my people? This is where it can get a bit contentious because back in the days that this was written, who were God's people? It was the people of Israel. It was the Israelites were God's people. And, and I've heard people say, well, you know, these Old Testament promises, they were, they were given to the nation of Israel. Um, I remember reading something about another one of my favorite verses, Jeremiah 29, 11, and the person said, well, you can't apply that to your life because it was for the people of Israel. But I say, no, no, because um, if we are now also part of God's people because of Jesus Christ, we are also now God's people. We belong to him. Therefore, God can speak prophetically to us through his Old Testament promises. And as a church, God has spoken numerous times through the book of Joshua prophetically to us. But, you know, all of God's Old Testament promises can apply to us. But, you know, well, yeah, most of them, but, but this one, this one's very specific to the land of Israel, isn't it? Because it starts, the verse before starts, um, starts by talking about the fact that, you know, there could be famines and plagues, and then if you turn, you know, pray, um, then I'll heal their land. And then the next one, so I'm very attentive to prayers um, spoken in this prayer. So, so yeah, I know praying and humbling ourselves, those are, those are good things, but it's not for New Zealand, is it? Well, in actual fact, I believe that the target audience for this verse, it was a prophetic, um, it was a prophetic promise for the church, not necessarily for the people of Israel. 
And why do I say that? Well, we just need to look at the next little bit of the scripture. If my people who are called by my name. So I was looking into the people that lived in Israel, the Israelites. They were never called by God's name. So what were they called? Well, initially, they were called the Hebrew people. And I looked up the word Hebrew, and Hebrew means wanderer. That's the meaning of the word. It's because Abraham, he was a nomadic person. He came from his homeland to the promised land of Canaan. But even when he was in the promised land of Canaan, he remained a wanderer, a nomadic person. So you get Hebrew. Um, And then his grandson was named Jacob, but his name got changed to Israel. Okay, and if we remember six, eight weeks ago, Phil spoke on Israel. And we know that Israel, and that's where Israelite comes from, Israel means wrestle with God and think, oh, yeah, God's name's in that. But no, it's not. You see, the, the God in Israel is El, for short for Elohim. Now, Elohim is not God's name, okay? Yahweh is God's name. Elohim is a title. It's a title. It means God, but it's not a name. A little bit like Pastor Phil. Okay, now I can call Phil Pastor and he'd know who I'm talking about, but it's not his name. His name's Phil. Great name, by the way. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, so um, Pastor Phil. So, um, and then the final thing that the people that lived in that land at the time, were they were called Jews. Though not at Solomon's time, but in the time of his son, they were called Jews. And Jews, Jew is short for Judah which is a tribe of Israel, and Judah is an awesome name. Awesome. I was looking into it, and like, there's so much depth and meaning to it. It means praise, but it's not God's name. So when God says, if my people who are called by my name, he can't mean the people of Israel. However, what are we called? We're called Christians. Oh, where does Christian come from? It comes from Christ. Now, is Christ a name? And yes, it is. It is is a title, okay? It means anointed one. And sometimes the Bible uses the title Christ Jesus, the anointed one Jesus. But other times it uses it as a name, you know, Jesus Christ. So linguistically, it's used as a name. So Christ is a name. We are called Christians. So when God says, if my people who are called by my name, who's he talking to? Oh, yes, He is talking to us. So therefore, this scripture is for us. This scripture is for New Zealand. You know, he will come. And if you look at the last word, it says, I will heal their land. Now, if this was a specific prophecy for the nation of Israel, it would say, I would come and heal your land. It doesn't say your land. It says their land. And I'm saying that New Zealand is part of their land. New Zealand is included in this prophecy. Whew. Okay, so, so there's a promise for us. There's a promise for New Zealand. So we better, we better see what God is asking us to do. So if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. So, hmm. <laughs> it's not too hard. Remember Deuteronomy chapter 30, not too hard. Um, and if we look at who's the best example of somebody who has humbled themselves, and you just can't look pr- through... You can't look past Jesus. Uh, Not Deuteronomy. um, Philippians chapter 2. It's a great chapter. Another one of my favorite passages. Um, It talks about Jesus humbling himself and humbling himself even to the point of death on on a cross. And he's serving us. And that's how he's humbling himself. But if we're wanting to humble ourselves, then that's not particularly useful. Okay, Dying on a cross, not an option. Another great example of um, Jesus humbling himself was when he washed his disciples' feet. He was their leader. He was their teacher. Um, yet he went and took the um, position of the lowliest servant. So we can humble ourselves by serving others. Um, but if I want to humble myself, well, to be honest, feet are gross. Okay? Amen. And, and if I go out with a bucket and a brush into the street and say, I need to wash your feet for the nation, I'm going to get some weird looks. Right? And so, so it's a great example of Jesus humbling himself, but it's not a particularly useful one for us, 
okay? Um, so that we want something that we can all do. And there's something that I'm going to be do, doing tomorrow in order to humble myself in prepare, preparation for the prayer meeting tomorrow night, and that's something called fasting. Fasting. And see, fasting's a way of humbling ourselves. And I'll explain it like this. Um, you see, I love food. Oh my goodness, I love food. Who was at the potluck last week? You know, it's so much food. It was beautiful. Tina, your curry, that was delicious. You know, so I love the taste of food. I love the feeling of when your belly is full, when you're satisfied. And I was actually with, uh, talking to a psychologist with this week, and they said that, you know, when your belly's full, um, it sends all these great neurotransmitters to your brain um, to, to make you feel good. Okay. So, so, one, I love food. Two, I've got no willpower. <laughs> no willpower when it comes to food. If there's food in front of me and I can't eat it, I will. Yeah, yeah, I know. So, I mean, I'm a cyclist. I'd like to do a lot of cycling, and it would be great if I could lose a couple of kilos in order that I could get up the hills a bit faster. But I just, I just can't make it past the cookie jar at work, you know. So um, I'm a bit slow on my bicycle because of that. Okay. Yeah, it does help on the downhills, but that, uh, it does. No, it does. It, it, it actually makes you... It actually makes you faster on the downhill, but unfortunately, it makes you a few seconds faster on the downhill and a few minutes slower on the uphill. <laughs> so, anyway. So, I love food. I've got no willpower, and so I just can't fast in my, in my own strength. And the other thing is I get really grumpy if I don't eat. Anyone else do that? Okay. So, the, so the net result of that is I just actually can't fast in my own strength. Okay, I've tried, I've tried, and I cannot make it past my refrigerator. So tomorrow morning, tomorrow morning when I fast, I'm going to be completely reliant on God to get past my refrigerator. I'm going to be completely reliant on God to make it past a cookie jar at work, okay, in order to fast. Okay, so, so by fasting, you're humbling in yourself because you're completely relying on God. And I tell you what, you come to a prayer meeting after you've been fasting, there's a new level of prayer to be had. Okay, Mark chapter 9, Jesus talks, um, Jesus' disciples, they can't heal this boy, they can't heal it. And then Jesus comes and he heals this boy. And then Jesus said, look, this only can happen through prayer and fasting. So fast, that indicates there's a new level of prayer to be had if you fast and pray. Hallelujah. So that's the next thing on our left. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. Guys, we've got to pray. We've got to be a praying church. You know, so I'm hoping that you guys are wanting to join me tomorrow night when we pray. Because we're going to pray for the nation tomorrow night. Okay, but how do you pray? Well, prayer is simple. Prayer is simply talking to God. There's so many ways we can pray. Uh, one thing prayer shouldn't be, and for so many Christians, this is all is going to God with a list of things they think they want. You know? And yes, it should be part of praying, but it's not the only thing in praying. The kids actually have a great acronym. acronym acronym. I'm not very good at this pronunciation thing, am I? A great and a acronym, um, which is, you know, the word, the word pray, P-R-A-Y, and pray, um, P for praise, you know, praise and worship should be part of our prayer. Um, R for repentance, we need to repent, we need to ask for forgiveness for anything we might have done wrong. A is asking, so asking should be part of prayer. But it's not the only thing. And why is yielding? What's God telling me to do? You know, and so part of prayer is listening, listening to what God has to say to us. In fact, another way of praying, Jesus taught us how to pray, didn't he? His disciples are, how do we pray? And why don't, why don't we all pray that together now? So, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
for yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah. There's so many ways to pray. Cool. So prayer is another key that we need to do. But also, it's easy. It's easy. It's not too difficult for us, is it? Okay, so we humble ourselves, we pray. What's the third thing he asks us to do? To seek his face. Now, I'm not really going to go much into detail about that because we've spent six months talking about being face to face with God. But seeking his face, you know, worship, prayer, seeking his face. And then the last thing he asks us to do is to turn from our wicked ways. Turn from our wicked ways. And I used to think, oh, yeah, I did that. I did that back in 1997 when I gave my life to Christ. I turned from my wicked ways. Uh, but then, no, it's, it's not. Yes, it's true. It's yes, I turned to Jesus. But turning from our wicked ways, coming before God in repentance is something we have to do regularly. You see, uh, we all, um, you know, we all do things wrong. I'm only ever one decision away from doing something really stupid that's going to hurt people. Okay, so I need to be constantly turning from my wicked ways, constantly asking for forgiveness. In fact, part of the Lord's Prayer, which we've all just prayed, it says, forgive us our sins, because it's something we need to be continually doing. Okay, so that's what we need to do. That's all we need to do. We need to humble ourselves. We need to pray. We need to seek God's face. And we need to turn from our wicked ways. We need to come before God in repentance. But then look at the promise. What's the promise that God has got for us when we do these things? Well, he's going to hear from heaven. He's going to hear from heaven. And you think, well, God hears everything anyway, doesn't he? Well, yes, he does, but your thing is he's going to pay special attention to the things that we're praying because the things that are on his heart are now on our heart because we've spent time face-to-face with Jesus, um, face-to-face with God. So therefore, when we pray, the things that are on our heart are on his heart too. So he's going to listen to us. He's going to forgive our sins and forgiveness of sins comes through Jesus Christ. It comes through Jesus dying on the cross and we celebrate a communion to remember that. So um, when he's going to hear from heaven, he's going to forgive our sin and he's going to heal our land. He's going to heal our land. So, yeah, we've started by saying that, but it starts with an F. It starts with an if. It starts with an invitation. There's an invitation from God in this to partner with him in order to bring healing to our nation. So what's your part going to be? How are you going to respond to God's invitation? And I don't want you to worry about what other people are doing, what other churches are doing. You've got to decide, well, how am I going to respond to the invitation in the if that we have found today? Maybe, maybe your response is, well, actually, I need to prioritize God. You know, I need to seek him first, as it says in Matthew 6.33. Maybe it's like, I need to um, come to your prayer meetings. Maybe, I, maybe God's calling me to fast. Maybe God's calling me to corporate prayer because there's power in praying together. Um, Jesus, there's a scripture that I often quote, which is, you know, where two or three are gathered, there I am in the midst of them. And I use it in many instances for church, but it's actually talking about agreement together before God, which is prayer. So it's specifically talking about prayer that where two or three are gathered. So come and join us to pray together. Hallelujah. So what's your response going to be? So what we're going to do now, if we could all stand Okay, and we're going to sing the song available. And as we sing the song available, I want you to consider what's my response to the invitation that God has found in 2 Corinthians, 2 Chronicles 7.14.